Greetings and welcome to another episode of RTAF Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Norris, and thank you for being here. This week, my guest is none other than Mr. Michael Garfield. Michael is an artist. He is a musician. He is the host, editor, and producer of the Future Fossils podcast, which I highly, highly recommend if you like this episode. We get into a lot of stuff in this one. Talk about how humans are kind of forced into this situation to remain childlike or with an open mind through their adulthood and into their old age as we navigate this world of ever more disruptive technologies and situations. We talk about free will and the non-linearity of time. Hope I said that right. Not sure if I did. Anyway, time being non-linear. How about that? Future flowing backwards. We got some mind-bending stuff in this episode that I think you all will enjoy oh so much. And yes, if you're enjoying this episode and you'd like to see the podcast thrive, head on over to patreon.com slash RTAF podcast. There you'll find three different tiers of subscription available. $4, $8, 16 bucks. You get merch, you get video, you get shout outs, you get guest suggestions, and you're really helping me out. And I want to say thank you to all my 20 subscribers currently. Y'all are keeping me accountable, keeping me focused. So thank you all. And if you're not feeling like you can support the podcast financially, you can do other things. You can subscribe to our YouTube, for instance, RCAF on YouTube. You could write a review on Apple Podcasts if that's where you're listening. That really helps us get in front of more people. That helps us get into the ears of more people. Uh, Those positive reviews and those five-star ratings on iTunes. And you can follow us on Spotify. Tell your friends about us. Write beautiful prose and poetry about how much you love the show. Just kidding. I mean, if you want to do that, you can, but that's a weird request. Anyway, let's jump right into this episode. I think you'll find it mind-bending. I think it will give you a really unique perspective on this reality we live in. Michael has a great way of fractally speaking, putting it putting his tangents in a way that you can both follow and understand. He drills down into subjects while simultaneously expanding on others. And it's just brilliant. I think you're going to love it. Anyway, I'll shut up. Here is Michael Garfield. Michael Garfield. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm tired. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm all right. Um, I'm I'm actually pretty tired, too. I drank for the first time in months yesterday. Um, I didn't drink a lot. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm feeling it today. I think probably because I haven't been drinking nearly at all. And it was... I woke up kind of like, ugh, you know, and uh, altitude. I mean, you're you're acclimated, but sure, yeah. I'm, I'm still not convinced that living it a mile, yeah, is, makes drinking easy. No, definitely not. And uh, it's still dry out here, no matter what. I see you over there forcing water as well. That's I've oh yes, got mine down there too. But um, yes, yeah, full of deep sea minerals. Hmm. Mm-hmm. The you got the trace minerals, get on those. Oh yeah, oh yeah, baby. I I probably drink too many of them. Yeah. <laughs> I I you know, I think a lot about etymology. Uh huh. And I am absolutely a salty guy. Yeah. Like I woke up I woke up today just ready to fight, and I'm like, what is this? Yeah. You know, I'm like, is this is this <laughs> literally just because I drink salt water? Am I am I just an <laughs> asshole? Because I. Well, you know, I have this kind of many electrolytes kind of like a uh, very unscientific and you know unresearched theory that artists or people who are creative in general are are kind of dissatisfied a lot of the time and that's why we yeah. 
<laughs> we strive to create things to, you know, ostensibly make the world a better place. Yeah. Uh, I mean, make the world a better place. At least for ourselves. Seem... Yeah. I was going to say, you know, a lot of artists seem kind of driven by a vision or something like trying to, mm -hmm. to communicate something that they, that they then, you know, find that they can't. I remember Robert Venosa talking about that, about how he chased his first ayahuasca vision for his entire life. Oh man. You know, that like all of his paintings were just like him trying to get this one experience down and he just like, all right, good luck guy. You know? Yeah. And this is, this is a deep problem, you know, since this is a show about, about artistry and creativity and so on. Um, this is a problem that I've been having over the last year or so where, you know, I didn't write a lot of songs Mm -hmm. over the past decade I was busy doing like site specific improvisations yeah. and I kept thinking oh that's really cool I had to try and like get that down I had to try and learn that thing that I just freestyled yeah but then like last year I got a new guitar and it completely changed something inside me and I wrote like a whole album's worth of material and then I kept writing songs and also I have a you know I, I had a young uh, daughter and just hanging out with this kid and singing to this kid all the time. I feel like I'm just like, I'm dropping like a new track, like every day. Yeah. But I'm just not taking the time. <laughs> like there's a responsibility to the muse that has felt extremely burdensome lately. Yeah. Which is to take this flow and to like cut it into sausages, you know? Yeah. Like actually, actually record the things that I do. Cause some of my, like I would say 90% of my best stuff has just evaporated Sure. You know, it was like some amazing baby song that was like ridiculous and awesome and had an <laughs> extraordinary hook. And I just like did not get it on paper. And then below that is the like gigabytes of just like notes, video notes I've taken of songs yeah. that I came up with on the spot, uh, you know, just so I could remember what I was doing on the guitar. And then like below that are songs that I've played live but have no studio version. And then below that, I'm like trudging away at just trying to get the songs I recorded within three months. I mean, the songs I wrote within three months last summer, mm -hmm. all a, you know, a decent studio recording. And then meanwhile, I'm writing more songs. And it's just like, I, I you know, I used to object mm -hmm. to the idea of being just like a factory songwriter. Right. You know, of like... My uncle, who worked in the music business in a kind of a big way uh, for his entire career, and still does, actually, Bruce Garfield, he he used to manage Sinead O'Connor and Isaac Hayes Ooh, and nice. Eric Burden, and he's he's a, a, a badass. Um, he now runs the music commission in, in Columbus, Ohio, but he is basically retirement for him. But I remember when I started getting into playing shows, he said to me, uh, basically you don't sing well enough to be oh. a musician. Yeah. And, that stings. And, uh, so you should write songs for other people. Like your songs aren't bad. You just can't sing. Yeah. And I was like, I will show you. Yeah. And you know, and so I've, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot better, but have you taken that's any, not the thing. have you taken any voice classes or anything like that? Uh, a couple, yeah. you know, but yeah. it's mostly just, it's mostly just like mockingbird, you know, trying to emulate singers I respect. Right. And, and, and so, so the thing is that like now, you know, that was me at 21 or whatever. Yeah. Now at 37, I'm like, I'm actually writing too many songs to record myself. I really should have just taken him up on this. <laughs> and, and I should have realized that like being a songwriter puts you in cahoots with the people who might actually support your career as a, as a, as a stage performer, you know, as yeah, a recording yeah. artist, you know? Uh, and, and now I'm like, well, you know, there's something about, I mean, I guess what I'm, what I'm pointing towards yeah. is that when you really do sort of like find the vein, then your attachment to any individual creative product is less, you know, it's like at the beginning I was like, I'm not going to let somebody else sing this song. I worked on it for a year, totally. you know, I have 10 songs, this is mine. And now it's like, actually 
It's like triage. It's like I'm running a fucking COVID wing in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. It's like, would you take the song, please, yeah, and yeah, record yeah. it so that someone records it? Yeah. You know, would 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 someone please get the song out of my out of my shift? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, and I just because because otherwise you just end up clogging your your short term memory with all of this unfinished stuff. It's like I have 900 tabs open. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, end rant. Well, no, I, I love that. That's a good, uh, it's a good starting point, I think, because well, it touches on a few things. Um, like just the nature of music, I think is, is one of more than most other arts, I would say it's so ethereal, right? You, you can just kind of, if you know your instrument and you have like a pretty good handle of your voice, you can just come up with, a silly ass song on the spot if you're you know you're feeling kind of in a little jaunty mood or something but then you know it's if it's just for the benefit of you and your daughter in that moment it's it is this beautiful thing that maybe only, was only meant for you to right and that's yeah i think that's the hardest part about for me at least um having been an amateur musician myself was like really sitting down and, and being like, okay, this is a song. And it's like, it has a beginning and an end. And, <laughs> it, you know, like, yeah. I know you feel me on that. Um, but then, then I also thought about like songs, you know how some people are, uh, um, and this might be true for any type of artwork, but like some people are, are addicted to falling in love. But then like, once it comes time to, to sort of like <laughs> nurture the relationship into a very strong and fortified thing, it 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 gets a little more difficult. Oh my God, you're speaking to it, man. It's Peter Pan syndrome is what you're talking about. And mm. actually this is, it's funny that you bring this up because I know you wanted to ask me about the book that I'm writing. Yes. I'm stuck on the final, it's not the final chapter. It's, I, I intended it for it to go somewhere in the middle of the book, but mm. it may end up somewhere at the end at this point. But originally it was, uh, I was, you know, I had this whole sequence of ideas and somewhere in the middle was each, each chapter was about how the future is going to be a particular way because evolution is this, uh, in the words of Richard Doyle, mm -hmm. a search algorithm for the optimization of entropy production, meaning basically that evolution finds every, every available opportunity it 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 creates and then and then exploits and like fills new niches all the time yeah. it's like a you know a, a river finding every way to run down the mountain you know it's yeah. it's uh it's a thermodynamic process and so when people talk about the future and they say oh the future is going to be like this then they're forgetting that it's also going to be like a not million this. other yeah yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that's so when people say, oh, well, you know, there's going to be more of this in the future. It's like, yeah, but then also people will reject that and form a religion around rejecting right, that, right, right. you know, and like so there's 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 that. So at any rate, this this chapter in the book was on how the future is going to be cute and playful, <laughs> but then also like how the future is going to be sort of like terrifying and ominous um, and a big part of it is about the evolutionary pressure that we experience as humans and uh, as social creatures kind of more generally mm -hmm. to be young in mind through our entire lives, to be flexible yes. in our thinking because living in society, you know, it creates this sort of uh, recombinant multiplying force yeah. You know, the, the cities, for instance, uh, you know, the, the number of patents that come out of the city scales more, more than scales faster than the number of people living in the city, because, you know, you two people, you know, you've got yeah two interactions and then, you know, four people and it's factorial. Right. So you just, yeah. You've got this, this, uh, you know, three, three times three is nine and four times four is 16. And so you get this, this whole thing anyway. Uh, so the environment that we're creating, you know, people have this thing in the modern era about innovation, like innovation is going to save us. But the, the big, I talked about this on Brett Kane's 21st century vitalism podcast mm -hmm. recently, the big thing about in the, like the, the sort of 
uh, disclaimer, the fine print with innovation is that uh, if you chase that as the goal, then you end up undermining yourself. You under, end up undermining the systems that support you because innovation becomes disruptive to everything. Right. You know, like there's such a, there's such a thing as too much mutation. Like, you know, you can right. like organisms get cancer, you know, et well, cetera. It's, it's the, it's the polar or the poles of like conserving and exploring or like, you know, innovating i guess <laughs> right yeah so at any rate the this this whole thing is that like basically as the future becomes more and more metamorphic more unpredictable yeah. more uh you know just full of possibility then in order to navigate that landscape we must become childlike you know we must remain un unfinished yeah. you know and there's something about a human being that you compare to like other primates and we're we're basically like adult children the ne you know, neotony. Yeah, 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 yeah. neotony or, or pedomorphosis, these terms. Uh, and so, you know, it was just me kind of doing this linear extrapolation into, into the future saying that that the future of human beings is probably that we're going to end up being even, like, assuming we don't destroy ourselves, we'll be more childlike in the future than we are now. You know, yeah, because, because it will be demanded are, of us. Yeah, like I mean, come on, like they 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 talk about adolescence now extending into your late twenties. Did you, you say know? late thirties? Right, twenties. Oh no, yeah, yeah to thirty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, by but you know, like that's that's one of those things where it's like, uh, are my kids going to be going to college at like thirty five? You know, or, right? Yeah. So, or you know, will college even? You know, our institutions are doing the same thing. Like college itself is sort of like breaking up into. Uh, you know, a bunch of just sort of certification programs, it seems like, yeah. you know, and so people are just kind of patching stuff together. You know, you you came right. out, our parents had a fully formed identity at 18. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's like, I always think about that, like how our generations so are so different. And, and so, yeah, so like follow that trend and, 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 you know, and you see this in music too, right? Like uh, the, like songs are getting shorter. Yeah. Songs are getting less complicated, you know, because, in, you know, evolutionarily speaking, uh, it's easier to like squeeze through a narrow hole in the wall, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's it, you know, like if you're looking at like a landscape of possibility and you have to kind of thread the eye of a needle, yeah. uh, it's easier to lose parts than it is to like gain parts. Yeah. yeah. And so there, there's a trend in, in the, like there's a developmental bias in evolution towards simplicity and mm -hmm. And so like, as our, it, there, it's a, it's a complex interplay between like, yes, our interactions and our environments and in some way our cognition, generally speaking, like the biosphere is getting more complex, but as it gets more complex, it's putting this pressure on us to, to kind of maintain certain qualities of our sort of pluripotent embryonic state into <laughs> adulthood. Right, you know, right, and remain on remain incomplete, and my God, like it took my wife and I fourteen years to like settle, you know, some do to do what our parents did in like three. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I feel you. On and that. and so the the irony is, or the poetry, I should say, uh, is that this book is I've I've been sitting on this chapter of this book for years like un unable to finish the book because like how it's would you express it yeah it, it's yeah. the only thing left and so you know but okay so here's the last piece of i want to stack on that which yeah, is yeah. that when it comes back to the songs um that like as you approach the muse like as you become more and more creative and more and more tapped into that like I think of somebody like Reggie Watts, who's a massive inspiration to me. Yes. Um, Reggie just doesn't write music, you know. He's just sort of like right. whatever. I mean, I'm sure that like there are there are exceptions to this where he's been called in to commission a thing, you know. Right. But like yeah. by and large, I remember seeing him at Moogfest. I, I spoke at Moogfest in 2016, and he he was headlining there, and they had a. At some point, he was like making fun of people who ask him to play that song that they heard on his record. <laughs> and he was like, are you yeah. kidding me? Like, I just, I just like, that's off the dome, dude. Like I have no, yeah. And your attachment to any of your specific creative outputs 
gets smaller and smaller. And and so this is why like the Greeks talked about how the, the muse doesn't actually care about you, you know, right. Like, the, <laughs> or like muses are not actually concerned with the artists, you know, they're just this like fountain of, of creativity. And, you know, and so I'm, it's, it's a weird thing to be like, well, you want to honor the inspiration by getting it down, you know, like, getting it down on paper or right. on record somehow. But at the same time, uh, you know, you get into this, uh, this kind of ongoing thing, like people who get stuck in therapy, Yeah, you know, like they're just like never solving the problem. Right. You know, because this... and so that's all I wanted to stitch together. Yeah, man, that that's a, uh... That's a lot there. Um, I, I just want to say, first of all, like just as a possibility, and I, I don't know how rigorous you're, I, I, I figure you'll be probably rigorous with your book, um, but um, what better way to kind of express what you're trying to say in that chapter than leaving it unfinished potentiality? Have you thought of that? I mean, I, I know that that's very uh, unconventional and probably would people wouldn't get it. And I don't know. But to me, that's kind of like a humorous way <laughs> <laughs> to, to be like, see, see what I mean? Um, but notes, you know, Jeff Buckley, went after he died <laughs> yeah. and he left sketches for my sweetheart, the drunk, you know, which is this beautiful is his second album. And it was mm -hmm. this beautiful thing. Uh, but it is just sketches. And for for about 10 years, I had this this album that's now mostly done and mostly available online and mm -hmm. is still unfinished, even as I work on and publish this other unfinished album now. Uh, but this album, The Age of Reunion, that was like, uh, you know, like the best songs I'd written in the 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. And that I was just I, I was for years, I was thinking I should just publish a sketches for the Age of Reunion. Just like put the demos up and get on with my life. And if I accidentally drown in Wolf River like Jeff Buckley, then at least <laughs> it's there. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not like, I'm not belaboring over this. Uh, yeah. Also, also so, something heard. I thought of was like, the. I feel like the reason that Reggie Watts is successful is because he's he's in touch with the muse like we all can be. But he's probably a lot of times just, you know, he has his phone. So... I'm sure you follow him on Instagram. He'll just turn it on and be like, ooh, ooh you know, like just sing a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so he, it seems like he's kind of in this perpetual state of improv where at any moment he can hop over to the Moog or just hop on his phone and record a little bit. And it, not needing to even say, here is, here is the link in the sausage that you will now call a thing we will now name it and refer to it as its name rather than experiencing it as what it really truly is just a succession of uh, of sounds in a pleasing way and i think i i there's definitely some magic um in improv and that's that's how i pretty much start all my paintings because i i but there's some deep-seated belief in me that that's where the magic is and that's where the best stuff fountains out of i suppose yeah it's a very different thing i'm glad you it's funny you, you mentioned that because although you can't see it off uh, off the frame here mm -hmm. i have this painting that is in a similar state of it's like 90 percent there yeah <laughs> and i've just been like looking at it for two months now like <laughs> now what yeah, uh, and I know exactly what needs to be done, but it's such a different thing, because it, so this is true. I think about paintings and and music and all this. Thing. I'm so glad you brought this piece of it up. That each one of them has a life cycle, mm -hmm. and each one of them starts as this like, oh, it could be anything, and then as you play the game, it's sort of like a go game where you keep putting pieces on the board and it becomes more and more narrowly specified. And at yeah. the end you're locked in by all of your, your choices. Yep. And that, you know, I look at this painting and it's like, this painting is an old man, you know? And, yeah. and it's just, it's just 
you know, it's writing its memoirs right now. Yeah, I love that metaphor. Uh, that's such know, a beautiful like, metaphor, like painting as a as a cycle of life, a human a human life, literally. Yeah, and, and you know, so there's this early on, you you get to be like splashy and ex- exploratory, but then you know, to to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> the there there's a trend that I'm seeing in in painting now. Uh, you know, painting with with Todd Shepard actually was like this, and I found it so frustrating. Although I I love it and respect his logic, his wisdom in this. When we would collaborate on pieces, he would just like rake through a huge section of the painting. Mm, mm-hmm. When we were like closing in on something, <laughs> and you know, just like a huge black streak yeah, right yeah. through it, and just be like, all right, now there's a there's a rift. You know, and I think that that's that's uh, a symptom of and we're starting to see more of this in paintings. Like I think about, you know, people like uh, Oliver Vernon. Yeah. yeah. You know, as 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 people that are. Uh, including or like sort of like optimizing for the number of rifts in their work. Yeah. It's like reinventing yourself at 40. Or- Exactly, but because in, that's the thing the we're painting. doing now. Right, exactly. Because that's the thing that's in, that's like not only in it's like not only possible but encouraged, maybe even necessary. Right. You know, like the like we have I've I've gone through so many like three to five year situations in my life, and that's on the good end. You know, <laughs> like I know people that are like, yeah, I moved eleven times in eight years. Yeah, yeah. You know, this this kind of stuff like. There is no solid ground under the foot of millennials. I don't know how it feels for everybody else. Right, yeah. But I know that pretty much everybody in my generation, you know, is amphibious as fuck. (laughs) And, you know, and 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 you just have to be like, okay, reactivate tadpole genes. Yeah. And, and like, okay, we're going to find, you know, this new... um, it's it's time for me to like completely redefine myself again. Yeah. And and it, and it's it's weird because that stacks up against something that I really truly firmly believe that we we deserve elders in our society and we don't really have that many of them. Right. And the few that we have are very precious because they're going to help us sort of restore the topsoil of intergenerational wisdom transfer. Yeah. At the same time, uh, like it falls upon us now to stay young into old age in a way that I have a hard time reconciling with aging gracefully and like, you know, eventually recognizing that you're no longer supposed to be competing economically with people 30, 40 years younger than you. Right. You right, know? right. Right. It's, it's, it's confusing to me still. Yeah. That's kind of, it's kind of like, how do we define the parameters of staying young? Does it, is it just in your mind or do you, you know, do you have to go to X amount of festivals a year and, and, and party really hard or is it, you know, or is it just kind of, it, it, you're accruing all this wisdom. So you, and there's also the limitations of the body, which is, you know, everyone knows about if you're our age, I guess, or even younger, <laughs> you can start feeling it. Um, but yeah, it's like I think it's hard to define what stays young or what staying young means. And well, maybe like an elder is someone who's stayed young and opened and uh, kept the plasticity of their brain going into their sixties, seventies, eighties. You know, um, those but, are the people I really want to listen to. By the way, for the record, re- real quick, real quick. I think I'm going to call this uh, episode amphibious as fuck. So thank you for that one. <laughs> okay. Because that seems what we're we're kind of getting at is, uh, and by the way, we haven't we haven't talked about any of the uh, the prompts that that I that I sent you. But this is this is so rich, and I'm well, the I'm book. Really, yeah, the book. Yes. Yeah. So, when do you do you expect to finish the book? Uh, what? I mean, now you've inspired me to just try and like hack together something approximating a draft on this last chapter and throw throw it together and pitch it. Nice. I mean, it's it's all there in pieces. It's just a collection of essays I've written over the last five years, mm-hmm. and it's all or eight years, and it's all there. 
on my medium account okay uh in some form and you know part of me is kind of daunted by i mean when i when i wrote out the structure for the book actually there's like a whole other this is how it goes right like right. and this is exactly <laughs> we're back to the what i was talking about is like you know you end up writing uh kid a and then you've got amnesiac also right and like it's been a question for me like do i put this out as a double album or you know yeah, yeah. i think i really just need to cut kid a and then put out amnesiac and mm -hmm. make that a whole separate thing and allow it to be sort of a continuation of this line of thinking mm -hmm. rather than assume that i'm going to encompass all of this in one great thought and then meanwhile you know in endlessly forestall the one thing that would actually legitimize me as a non PhD carrying public pseudo intellectual, <laughs> you know, which is to have a, a, bub a published book. Right. right. So yeah, I think at, at, basically at this point, um, I was really trying to get it done before my first kid. Now I have two. And so yeah. I should probably just call it a game because it's yeah. all just been sitting there in the freezer for years. Yeah, man. Yeah. Go for it. Like, when I, I think one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten is to just, in terms of painting, is is to make like a hundred shitty paintings, even if yeah. And I know obviously you. I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say you've been writing and and speaking and kind of like, what would you say, consolidating your thoughts for a long time now, and you know you've probably put in those the, the equivalent of like a hundred paintings or a hundred drafts on something probably more if if i'm guessing right so yeah i mean just just get it done and if it's sometimes with a at the end of a painting too i'm like i could go deeper and get you know like we were talking about <clears throat> our friend getting lost in the details of uh, the audio earlier um it, it might be kind of something like that where you at a, at a certain point you have to say good enough next you know i think it was oliver stone that said that he never finished a painting i mean he never finished a movie he just walked away from it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i really appreciate that i feel like i really needed to hear that mm -hmm. and at least i don't know there's something about I'm, I'm really glad that i'm talking to you today because there's something about the paintings that i've always treated a little differently and i think it is again just a matter of how many paintings I've done yeah, and how like they used to be just like one a night, you know, like right, I do right. five a week while I was doing, you know, living in Boulder. And it, it almost, it and, was almost like you were treating them like uh, the songs you make up for your daughter now. Right. Yeah. yeah you're just like, Bleh, you know, get it out there. Yeah. And I, I, I felt very comfortable doing that with the guitar and, you know, like the cyber guitar improvisations. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the book, it's a different matter for some reason, just because it's the first one. Yeah. You know? yeah and yeah, so it's, yeah. it's like, this is the book. If I had written 17 books, I could probably just be crapping them out. Right. You know, do you, do you feel uh, like you have to make kind of a, a splash to, um, as you were kind of putting it, legitimize yourself? Is that, is that what's holding you back? Well, I hang out in it. I mean, I, my, I, my day job is among very prestigious elitist scientists right and uh yeah it's it you, occurs to me i think i've absorbed a little bit more of that kind of attitude than is perhaps actually healthy for me uh-huh um yeah <laughs> you know just that i mean it's been great because in certain ways i've been just radically undisciplined and i'm i'm glad to see you know i'm glad to be among people that had to complete a phd Mm -hmm. You know, just at that very level, that simple level, you know, that's like that's that barrier to entry while insufficient to play in this particular pool is nonetheless what holds all of these people together in a like, oh, yeah, you've been through that hor that ordeal, you know. Yeah, you've, yeah. You've, and I remember Daniel Pinchbeck said something similar to me uh, in uh, 2011 mm -hmm. at Burning Man, you know, when he was he was still head of the evolver editions at North Atlantic books. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get me to submit a book to them. And it, the book ended up being this book, but I, I kind of told Daniel he wasn't ever going to get it. <laughs> uh, 
you know, like it's not his, it's not his book to publish, mm. but, uh, he's, you know, he said to me, he's like, you know, you're, you need to write a book because it helps you crystallize your thoughts. You know, it, it's, right. it's important to, you know, to have to structure yourself in that way. And although, you know, three years among scientists running their social media accounts, I think mm. has made me a bit you know, like what I have actually structured myself to do is provide hot takes. Right. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, 280 characters. Right. On Twitter, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us are, again, this is to that the sort of like, thing. Yeah. The erosion of modern digital society is like, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting really, really good at providing a, a brilliant retort or yeah. like a, or a, a beautiful short compression of an idea yeah, yeah. but then you know it's it's extraordinary effort to swim upstream against the atomizing forces of modern society mm -hmm. and unpack a thesis over hundreds of pages you know yeah. and and then to be able to swim back downstream again and be like my book is about this in five sentences or less right you know wow yeah maybe we should talk about um just just what you do on a daily basis. I know you might not, you know, it might not be interesting to you, but I think it would give a little context to the listeners. Like, I, I, I know that, like, when I met you, I knew you as a painter, right? And then a musician. And then I realized you had this great verbal uh, fluidity and, and just, like, intelligence and the way that you can structure thoughts together, I'm like, oh, this guy, like, now I kind of view you as, as a intellectual, like a, 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 a thought leader in a way in our, in our community. Um, so maybe describe just kind of like what, what your daily, what your daily life is like, your day job. Um, and then we'll get into maybe like being a dad the second time around. Sure. And well, Maybe telling you a little bit about my day job will be sort of a banishing spell. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of what? Thought leader? Or well, just, what? well, no, in terms of just, you know, I, I'm i getting very, very tired of working in, in social media. Yeah. And I don't think that it's, it's it is, quote, no country for old men, which mm -hmm. is an allusion to the fact that Cormac McCarthy is a fellow at the Santa Fe Institute where I work. Right. And, uh, you know, kind of our spirit guide or something, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I mean, he's, th this place does complex systems science. It's a theoretical science organization. So they're not running like laboratory experiments. They're running computer simulations and, and, you know, an like analytical quantitative kind of research. Yeah. And they, I mean, basically their work is to formalize things in mathematics and then use the math to determine whether or not it holds any water. So everybody's kind of swimming the other way. And then there's a couple of us in, in the communications office whose job it is to take all of that stuff and bring it back into verbal models oh. out of, out of numerical models and into, you know, mathematical models and into verbal models. Wow. Uh, that can then help establish or or enrich or re or bolster or challenge the intuitions about systems that we have in our our daily lives yeah you know so like lots of research is being done there on on you know neuroscience and, and social science and evolutionary biology and you know astrobiology and the, the, the physics of cities and economies and so on, you know, anything where you've got uh, emergent properties appearing out of interactions between, between agents, you know, in, in, in a system where they're adapting to one another, they're adapting to each other's strategies, which is why, you know, for instance, uh, economies are not actually seeking equilibrium. Or like they're not, you know, like it's, mm -hmm. it, it would be a mistake to model an economy as something that's, that's, uh, 
you know, temporarily disturbed out of balance and then like finds a new balance because it seems like that'd be planet, the opposite, right? It, I mean, it's not, it's not what's happening. Like right. we live on a planet where we have a constant input of sunlight and chemical energy from the rocks and that's creating opportunities for, for things to grow and evolve and then, you know, collaborate and compete with each other. And the economy is just sort of an amplification of this in which, uh, you know, new products and services are produced that then change the economic landscape and change the strategies that people adopt in it. Mm -hmm. And then when, you know, you get this sort of game theoretical aspect where like enough people adopt a certain strategy and suddenly you have to, and then that changes the meta. I think the most useful thing for me in understanding complex systems was actually playing Magic the Gathering ah. growing up. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you build a deck, but then, like, you don't build a deck in isolation. You build a deck within a tournament environment. Yeah. You know? And so the which cards are in play at any given season mm -hmm. determines the meta strategy that everyone has to adjust to. There's like an emergent downward causal pressure right. occurring at the systems level that constrains what any one of us is going to do in terms of the decisions we make in building a deck and playing that deck. And the same thing is going on economically. Like, you know, nobody is safe from NFTs. I know that's something you wanted to talk to talk about, you know. And nobody's like, safe from like Instagram reels or TikTok. Exactly. Yeah, yeah no, th that exists now. You have to adjust to it. Yeah. Uh, whether you whether you accept it or reject it, you are going to have to come up with a stance. Yeah, yeah. Res with respect to this. Right. And uh, you know, and so there's this constant sort of uh, overturning of things that uh, you know that, that is typical of a system that is fundamentally out of equilibrium. You know, it's it's never going yeah. to find rest because what it does is it generates n novelty. It, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, I worry about all of this because you know, it, it, I think we're we're chasing this novelty off a cliff. I mean, this is something that you know, like Terrence McKenna evangelized. You know, yeah. this this Absolutely. kind of creativity. But then when you look at what what absolute creativity means, like what everything happening at once really means. That sounds. I saw this. Oh my terrifying. god, Nathan Pyle. <laughs> yeah, do you know Nathan Pyle? The the he does that the little alien cartoons on Instagram. Mm -mm. The, they're like aliens living as Earth people, and they're having these like hilariously sort of dissociated conversations. No. Uh, but he, I'll look he him just, up. Yeah, P Y L E. He just had this. Uh, this one panel on his feed recently about how it's like, well, we haven't made an everything bagel yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, we can't like, clearly we yeah, haven't yeah. made an everything bagel yet because like, look around you, there's still, you know, stuff that hasn't made it into this hypothetical everything bagel. And I think like, you know, it got me thinking his, his drawing for that looked a lot like the cover art for, this book, The Rapture of the Nerds by Cory Doctorow and Charles Strauss, which was a satirical mm -hmm. science fiction novel about the singularity and just like the singularity spamming, like Earth has been sort of walled off as a, a, a nature preserve for pre-singularity humans. But the, the, the cloud is still spamming Earth with disruptive innovation all yeah, the time. Yeah. And we have to like, Deal we have with to it. try and like firewall ourselves from you know, getting emulsified by this, this like cosmic apocalyptic God cloud of technology. Yeah. yeah. This, so that's where we are. Th this is really, uh, this is kind of edging up against a topic that uh, I thought that you and I would have an interesting conversation on. And it's just sort of what's, what's your stance on free will? Um, I know that might be a bit re reductionist, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we just as you're talking about all these emergent phenomenon coming up and having to adapt to them all, um, to me that 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 sort of indicates that like you recognize that there's like this uh, sort of cause and effect uh, stream or loop that we're all sort of swirling around in, um, 
how do you think about free will or do, do you think it exists in the way that like most people talk about it? I don't think free will is a bird you're going to catch in your hand. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think free will is a concept and so is determinism. Right. I don't, and I, by the way, just sorry, before you yeah. really go in, I, but I don't really fall on either one of those poles because I, I always think when I really start thinking about it, I'm like, well, it's some sort of either gray area or paradox. Maybe that's not the right word, but like they're sort of acting together, but n they're both and and neither nor in this, in yeah. this weird, weird way. Well, it, I think it, it depends I mean, maybe just me stewing in in the science that I do for my, my job has me thinking about things in terms of like information. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in evolution, we talk about random mutations, right? There's natural right. selection, which is the pressures of the environment. You know, that's like determined in some respect, you know, right. this is what's going to happen. There's NFTs now deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then there's also random select, I mean, random mutation and random mm -hmm. mutation is this, you know, noise generator, uh, kind of thing. Now, I don't know if I really accept that. I think that those are optical illusions, um, because it's happening at one scale. Like you're here at the human level, yeah, you know, yeah. you're not down inside the, the quote unquote machinery of your cells. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you're not. You're not standing out, you know, at the edge of the galaxy, looking at the galaxy as a giant thing that, mm -hmm. you know, has a heartbeat that lasts, you know, millions of years or whatever. Mm. And, you know, if you did, then, you know, if you were standing at either of those scales, then what's going on in, like, if I were one of my own cells, then what happens when I accidentally swallow some hand sanitizer or something would seem like the biblical plays. Yes. Yeah, it would yeah. just be this like, why God, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it would make no sense. You know, this is not, I mean, that would be a, a, a random thing. Uh -huh. And, you know, and like, likewise, I, I heard this really beautiful argument from Adi Livnot is an Israeli evolutionary biologist mm -hmm. who said that, you know, when you look at the quote unquote random mutations, they are actually, a, you know, they, they follow the rules of, like the laws of physics are still happening. Like right. you're not, you're not going up an entropy gradient mm -hmm. uh, to mutate. You're going down, you know, these are, these are basically, it's like, a, it's kind of like machine learning where or like the way that the brain wires itself together which is if two neurons fire at the same time then they they form you know they reinforce their connection to right, each yeah. other heavy in learning and the same thing is going on in in gene regulatory networks where if genes are expressed at the same time then they they're more likely to fuse into a single gene Interesting. and so and so mutations have to do with the way that like parts of the quote unquote book of your or genome, like certain parts of it are open at any given time and other parts are like curled up. And so certain parts are exposed to, you know, mutation at the same time and others aren't. And so you get this, this thing where it's like you end up being able to encode complex behaviors into the genome, not just the epigenetic stuff which is fascinating and a whole kind of separate conversation but that like you can't actually imprint complex behaviors into the genome uh and and so it's like that's not random yeah it only looks yeah. it only looks random because it's like way down there yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in the same way that city life looks random when you're in a plane looking down on Denver and you're just right. like, I don't know why those little dots are moving around like yeah, they yeah. are, you know? And and so I, I really think that the whole free will thing is a matter of like the information that you have about a system, which is completely contingent on 
the resolution of your equipment, let's right. say, right? At like, what scale you're at. Yeah, and also the integration of your equipment. Like, you know, you can absolutely take anesthetics and suddenly think <laughs> that you don't have any control over your own hand. Yeah, yeah. You know, or like that you you just disappear because you're not your brain patterns aren't integrated enough to hold together something that seems like a a self that's doing stuff. Yeah. Um <laughs> And I've been there. So, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's, and that's a real thing. So, I mean, the, I guess I think that the, the, the issue of free will is crucial on, I mean, let me be clear that I guess the take a step back and, and get meta about this. Yeah. To say that, and this is like a core theme in the book too, to say that the, the universe is any particular way is to take the raw cloth of your experience and like, you know, cut and sew a piece of clothing out of it and wear it around to protect yourself from the elements. You know, you're not... Yeah. Um, somebody else could take the same thing and cut it and sew it a totally different way. And... There are, of course, there are going to be like warps and woofs in the fabric that suggest certain interpretations that people converge on. Right. Um, but the fact that like both free will and determinism have been so robust for so many thousands of years across cultures suggests that they are both true and both insufficient. Yeah. And and I, you know, I, I, again, to call on Richard Doyle, who's one, one, one another one of my great inspirations. He's a, an English professor at Penn State University. In his book, Darwin's Pharmacy, he talks about the use of psychedelics uh, or what he calls ecodelics because he says, you know, that what we, the, way, the words we use to describe these, these uh, chemicals and the experiences that they engender are really important in the programming of those experiences. You right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he prefers ecodelics because it, it has one, it has less baggage, and two, it it seems to him to be a more accurate. Uh, it it seems to be going back further to the source rather than saying like, oh, my and like psychedelics meaning like mind manifesting. This is like the manifestation of the ecology more, right? And yeah, that's what like we you, come you, from. You know, the whole thing is that you're folding over what you thought was in here. And what you thought was out there. Yeah. And it turns out it's actually some kind of like pastry, like baklava <laughs> yeah, type kind of layered thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And like it's it's, you know, you fold it over and over and over again and, and until you no longer you know, and that this this kind of nonlinear uh transformation of subjectivity is he says what's required of us to make sense of the world that we've created here in this century. That you know that, that he he says uh, psychedelics are kind of training wheels for tr transhumanism, basically. Oh yeah. But I mean, but, that makes but sense. when when you do this, you know, his point is that the whole paradox of free will and and fate mm -hmm. completely just falls off because there's no longer a world acting on the self in that simple way anymore yeah i see you know? i see like the free will determinism and the concept of self being sort of like two sides of the same coin in a way because like without yeah. the concept of self you you can't really say um free will exists and or no it's all determinism but if you sort of if you have a transcendent experience, I guess, to put it, to put it in the simplest form, then you realize that this, this whole self that you've been identifying with your whole life probably is, uh, is sort of this, uh, more like a process or more like, uh, just some, some sort of like experience rather than like a noun. It's also, you know, I, th I think it's really important to go back to, you know, the, the original wisdom traditions that were doing, you know, phenomenological research, like, you know, like the, like Buddhism and, yeah. and Vedanta in particular, you know, get in there and, and you just cannot argue with their conclusions once you've actually done the work. 
Yeah. Because they're like, you know, you sit with your mind long enough and you realize that your mind is actually just a bunch of modular processes knocking each other around. Mm -hmm. But like the, the, this apparent singularity of selfhood is a virtual reality. It's like a construct. Yeah, yeah. That's that's only happening because it's, you know, it's propped up in some way or is the interference pattern of this you know, this this whole different, you know, stew of processes that again, the, the more closely you look, extends beyond whatever the boundary that you thought of yourself having. Uh, you know, so that this is this is uh you know, one of these things that we're just going to have to deal with now from now on, right? Which is the the way that, you know, we, we think about old cultures and how they would like bury themselves with their stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah. how weird that is to us. And, yeah. and it's like, yeah, but, you know, let's be real. Your phone is a part of your body. It's, you know, yeah. your phone has been a part of your body in an obvious way for the last 10 years, right. at least. Yeah. You know, and, and like, this is not, you know, we're, so the question of like, what is human is, I think, pretty much the same as the question of like, what is a virus, you know, because like we say, oh, viruses aren't alive. Well, mm -hmm. why aren't they alive? Well, because they require cellular, you know, cellular processes to reproduce and it's like oh you mean like i require a trader joe's you know like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like i yeah. require a cell phone the internet. now yeah you know like that maslow's hierarchy of needs that somebody like sketched in wi-fi at the bottom <laughs> and then somebody else sketched in battery life below yeah, that, yeah, yeah, you know yeah and we it's yeah. like yeah the, the closer you look the more dependent you realize you are on things and that on was the system the Buddhist point you know, was this web of interdependency. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So where, where is the self? It's like, okay, so there is something that looks like a self. Sure. Uh, and, you know, for the sake of us living together in this constant emergency, we call civilization, <laughs> then we probably need something. Right. You know, yeah, we have something there. Like what? maybe I, maybe in another 200 years, I'll just have a QR code. I won't have a name. Yeah. Yeah. But like <laughs> still I'll what? have a, I'll have a private key. That's right. Th that guy. Right. What's McKenna say? He says the, the reason to have an ego is so you know, whose mouth to put the food in at dinner. Or yeah. <laughs> that's, well, I mean, I love that's that funny. You, oh my God. Years ago when you and I were painting at root wire, I remember having a conversation with this dude, who said that he managed to go completely breatharian, but he was only able to live off of prana with no food for as long as he was living alone in this cabin up in the, the Smokies somewhere, like a couple of months that he went without food, without having to interact with people. And then as soon as he had to go back down and get roommates and all this stuff that suddenly he found himself like eating steaks again. He was like, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, and it's and I it, similarly the most awakened person in like a concrete neurophenomenological, quantifiably measurable way that I can think of <laughs> is this guy Gary Weber, who is Rich Doyle's mentor. I think we who, talked about know, him put, uh, last time. Maybe we did. Yeah, you put him in a brain scanner, and there's no activity at all in the parts of the brain that are correlated with like coming up with some story about who you are. Yeah, yeah. Like stitching your memories together in a sequence. Right, right. You know, like delimiting your body from everything else. Those uh -huh. parts are quiet. They've been, they have been, uh, you know, bled dry basically by his meditation. And he told me that, and I, I'm sure I said this in the first one because this is why I bring him up, is that he said that he only experiences his, his self when he's got really low blood sugar. Yeah. And, and, you know, so to me, the ego is like an auxiliary generator or uh -huh. something. It's like something that it, it it must have existed before we were living in society with each other in some way, but only temporarily. Like, like right. uh, what is it? Zebras don't get ulcers. Robert Sapolsky, this kind of stuff. Like the, you know, like trauma is basically the, the, the pathological ex extreme of being someone at all. Right. Like having some identity. Right. You know, we, it's like ba some, having basically it's only because of social norms that we don't regard having an ego as trauma. 
Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it is. I think it is trauma. Yeah. Basically. It's like the reason, like, you know, you, you why do you go to a therapist? You know, because stuff happened to you when you were a kid and you didn't feel safe. And like now you're, you know, you, you have all these weird habits and yeah. complexes. And it's like, that's what you are, you know, at that level. But then, you know, when you when you d- go dig down into that web of interdependency and you're all of this other stuff, then your trauma is sort of like, eh, yeah, you know, it's just a it's little, there, but it's it's like a. It, it's like a, you know, a shitty curtain that got ha- hung up on your window of the self at some point. And yeah. You, you haven't or, taken you know, it like down Oscar to Wilde's clean. last words, right? It was like, either those drapes go or I do something like that. <laughs> like he was looking at the, he was like, his last words was like some like, you know, sassy. Just hilarious shit. Queenie kind of comment about the drapes, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's Beautiful. not going to, that's not going to work. I guess I'll have to die. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What a way to go. Um, So let's see. Okay. um, Yeah, I listened to one of your more recent podcasts, and um, I I really was fascinated with the guy you had on, Eric Wargo. Is it Wargo? Yeah. This whole idea about, um, and to me, this sort of ties into the um, determinism free will thing. This idea about like events in the future flowing what we would subjectively consider backwards to influence events in the present or determine, I guess would be a stronger word. Um, I don't, I don't have a, an articulated question about this actually, but I I just wonder if there's like a, a jumping off point that we, we could talk about, um, or, or if you've experienced that, you know, he talks about precognition, right. And dreams, Mm -hmm. Like I've definitely had some dreams where I'll be like, it, it'll uh, like I predicted my friend's move to Colorado before I had talked to him at all. Like me and my other buddy were already out here, and you know I had this dream, and I wrote it down. And like one of the one of just the standalone lines was Duke's moving to Colorado! Exclamation point. And then it it happened. Or, you know, he told me, like, a month later, like, hey, I'm, I'm moving out there. Um, so I don't know if you have any, have, uh, have had any experiences like that um, or or can, can speak to that in a more uh, robust, quantifiable way than I just did. My whole life is full of those experiences. <laughs> I think most people, if they're honest with themselves, admit that they've had experiences like that. Mm-hmm. And I think we're... One of the things that when I talk about my frustrations with my my current job is that in order to accept what Eric Wargo is saying about the nonlinearity of time, you have to dispense with the fundamental taboo of physics right now. Uh, like, you know, not physics as it has always been, not physics as many respectable people like quantum physicist John Archibald Wheeler, for instance, Mm -hmm. think of time or Julian Barber. But the majority of people are, are held due to, you know, weird sort of socioeconomic pressures into this position where you're not even allowed to think that you, that the future exists already. Hmm. And, And, you know, like, and to be fair, to be fair, God, my wife just binge watched all of Letter Kenny, and now she says that to me every time. I, <laughs> you, you know, so I've just I've just internalized the abuse. But at any rate, the um, the you know to, to to be even handed about this. There you go. And Eric is willing to go here too. Uh, there is entropy. You know, uh, things sure. fall apart. Uh, there, you know, the future is uncertain in ways that the past is is specified. You right. know, is 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 certain, and yet, even though we have this grain, uh, or you know, this this kind of directionality, calling it an arrow of time is misleading because I agree with Eric that the evidence is strongly in favor of time being very naughty. 
you yeah. know, time being very Nautilus, like, naughty. <laughs> naughty, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> N A N A U T or K N O T. Yeah. Um, either one, yeah. Um, that it's you know that there are. It's like a, you know if you think about time as a river, which is another possible you know uh, popular metaphor. Mm -hmm. Then a rivers flow in one direction, but they also have eddies right. and like tidal back backflow yes. and stuff like this. You know, it's not simple. Uh, and you would think that people working in nonlinear fluid dynamics and so related disciplines right. would appreciate that like shit just does not move in a straight line in nature. It just doesn't. Right. Uh, and yet that's just not acceptable to talk about those things uh, among most scientists. Why do you think Which that is? Which is a real is? disappointment because, you know, you and Eric's done a fantastic job of exploring this. You dispense with that one taboo, and suddenly you have this vastly simple. It's 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 much more parsimonious. Uh, you have this much easier way of explaining all of these other things, and you know, I there's some part of me that just adores the way that he comes at the entire field of paranormal research from within. As a, as a hardcore materialist and mm -hmm. says, oh, telepathy, near-death experiences, past life stuff, UFOs, remote viewing. Mm -hmm. Like, sorry, guys, all of this can be explained by getting rid of this, this. one thing. Yeah. Which is that, you know, that, oh, you will later find out when you talk to your friend that you knew what they were thinking, you know, yeah, yeah. or like you pick up the phone. It's like, okay, so telepathy is real. You knew your friend was about to call you. Cool. But what is, what is the mechanism? Right. Well, the mechanism could be that you're about to know and that you have access to some future state of your own brain. And mm -hmm. when you actually look at the, you know, look at all of the, the evidence about this stuff, nobody knows anything that they're not going to find out later. You know, right. yeah, like yeah, there's, yeah. there's no, there's no like cosmic Akashic thing that somebody has objective access to information. Yeah. You know, when they, when they find out about like when they have a dream about a plane crash, that's going to happen three days later, their dream is like the pictures that they draw from their dream are like pictures of what they're going to see in the newspaper in three days. Yeah. You know? And, and so it's, it, it's humbling uh, but I, I, you know, and I, I'm, I'm glad that Eric and I were able to get into the ways that this isn't just about like the ways that information can travel backwards through culture and not just through an individual life Yeah. because you had that multiple scales thing back in, you know, and you can talk about the way that we're binding time collectively, you know, the way that, that a culture can carry a prophecy. Mm. So like, you know, so-and-so didn't actually live to see this event, but Yeah, how can we tie but, that in? <laughs> yeah, the car alarm is perfect there. I don't. Um, but you know the fact that like this became a core fit feature of their cultural environment and was like handed down, handed down. He gives the example yeah. of the the Dogon people of Australia, mm -hmm. who for centuries had this this understanding about the serious star system that they could not have had with the technology that they had available to them. They, they, they were able they to knew see. There were stars there yeah. that were in, invisible to the naked eye. But then eventually they meet an anthropologist who tells them this and everybody's mind is blown. And it's a, it's a significant event for him and for their entire culture. And so they, and so, they had just to break this down to make sure that I understand. So they had a prophecy about, uh, that the Sirius star system had more stars than they could see with their naked eye. And it was a, a prophecy or was it like, they well, just, it was like, it was knowledge. just part of their stories that they had carried, that they had carried. And it's like, well, where did it come from? And they said, Oh, it came from, you know, our, our, our stories tell of this, like, you know, this strange foreigner. And it's like, we, because we insist on a linear time. Yeah. We are like, Oh my God, they must've been in contact with aliens. 
Right. But it's right. like, but really, who's the alien here? It's the white dude. It's the white guy who came right. to Africa <laughs> and was like, yeah, yeah. you know, telling them this stuff in their own future. Wow. You know, so I mean, it's just once you once you open up to that kind of stuff, basically everything else falls. Um, to, or I mean, I'd like to a talk- lot of things. I'd like yeah. to talk about about UFOs as it regards to this because yeah. um, um, I think something that I heard you say, and this this goes along with my favorite ever McKenna quote, which is um, cultural expectations are intrinsically woven into strange encounter experiences. When he's talking about UFOs, um, mm. and so like this day and age, we're uh, we, you, I think you said this that we're obsessed with sort of the mechanics of what these could be and how fast they can go. And, oh man, it was at the drop point in one second. And how did it know that the plane was going there? But I mean, no one, you brought up the point that no one's asking why, what are they doing? What do they want? Stuart Davis, (laughs) Stuart Davis was talking about that on the host of aliens and artists. Who's also a Boulder guy. He's actually one of the reasons I moved to Boulder back in 2007 fantastic songwriter big inspiration to me he has a podcast the last couple of years yeah his aliens and artists podcast cool uh when he came out of the closet about having a you know years and years of encounter experiences wow that it wasn't just him it was like he was having these with his family and other people were getting swept up into it and it was very you know very strange uh he decided he was going to do an oral history you know, and just like interview as many people as he could about their weird encounters. And then he started researching it. And then he's now co-running this experiencer group with a couple other uh, folks, Jane and Kristen, who, you know, basically created like a support group for contactees. Uh, And yeah. And so, I mean, one of the things that he talks about is the atemporality or, or the sort of trans temporality with respect to the way that we commonly understand time now as a species Mm -hmm. uh that you know that some of his contact experiences why yes come in (laughs) hold on just a second it's like that scene in jurassic park you can hear the footsteps getting close (laughs) oh no she's back hold on (laughs) I can't hear you though. There we go. Do you go. want to say hi to everybody? Say, you want to say hello. She said no. She said no. Nah. She said no. Nah, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna put my headphones back in then too. Wink. <laughs> but um, God, where were we? Oh yeah. So he Stuart talks about how some of his experiences that he's had with these mantis aliens are that he was able to like witness the way that they experience time and that for them time is like taffy that's like all folded up on itself and that there are give me that Mm -hmm. we're not going to shake that during the podcast that's completely inappropriate no no (laughs) (laughs) deal with it people yeah this is my life now yeah this is great Um, that uh that yeah it's sort of like he was talking about time being folded up in the same way that i was just talking about self and other being folded up and that there are these points of resonance you know like calendrical uh resonances and so on you know eric wargo talks about this too you know that in the body of precognitive dream stuff that he's researched that often dreams are about stuff that's happening like next year on the same day yeah yeah you know that yeah. And so, you know, you start to wonder about calendrical observances, like, you know, the, the holiday it, calendar it, this, and like why it is that we've, you know, we've picked these things and like people like Gordon White talk about, you know, moments in time as being like living entities unto themselves that have yes. like character, more like a Mayan kind of thinking about yeah, time. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. Yeah. And, and, and so, so that's part of it. And then the other part that you're speaking to is what I got from the historian, William Irwin Thompson, who critiqued, um, oh my God, what is his name? He wrote Chariots of the Gods. Graham Hancock? Uh, no, 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 no. Someone else. Uh, Sorry. No, but there's a, but there, he, Bill Thompson, uh, who I had on Future Fossils back in 42 and 43, 
and did two interviews with him before I started that show and is like a, a huge, huge light on my shoulder. Yeah. And and the crankiest old man I could ever aspire to be. <laughs> um, and, you know, passed last year. He talked about misplaced concreteness and how how people were, uh, you know, projecting this sort of technological metaphor onto, no, honey, we're projecting a, a tech metaphor onto their, their tools. I mean, onto, onto these, ex these phenomena we experience. So actually Graham Hancock has talked about this in his book, Supernatural. Mm -hmm. No, but his, as far as I can tell, his work is basically just, a, all right, well then go, go to mama. Mm -hmm. Uno momento. <laughs> as far as I can tell, <laughs> uh, Graham Hancock's work in this area is basically just a popularization of Jacques Vallée, who was the first person to point out the isometry between ufo narratives and fairy lore yeah you know and, yeah. and so there's that yeah and and i think that yeah i think that terence and many other people have been wise to point out that something about the nature of this phenomenon makes it obvious that we are importing you know like smuggling our our uh associative networks into these experiences and like skinning them like you know like like wrapping them in something that we can understand which is the best thing about the movie contact yeah you know, she goes through the, the wormhole she meets this alien and it looks like her dad right you know and it's like well yeah you just can't understand what you're actually looking at so we're just doing this so that we can have a conversation and that's what wargo says about precognition generally is mm -hmm. that is that uh the parts of our precognitive experience that we're actually capable of cognizing that our brainstem doesn't just throw out as noise are the parts that fit the lived experience we've had up to that point already in some way. Yeah. So he gives this great example of um, uh, Vladimir Nabokov who wrote Lolita and as a, you know, as a, as a youth Nabokov has this dream that, his book is picked up by uh, these like s circus producers mm. that have these Russian names and it ends up being produced by like Kubrick and I forget who else. Um, but it's like his precognitive dream about his book being optioned by Hollywood is like skinned in his lifestyle in early 20th, 20th century Russia you know, where it's like they're Russian names and it's a circus instead of movie theaters and right. like all of this stuff. But it's yeah, like yeah. the his future is still communicating to him. Right. It's just communicating to him in the only language he can understand. Or yes. It's like the only parts of it that he's able to make any kind of sense of. Uh, and this kind of stuff happens all the time. And that's that's how my experiences have gone. And maybe now we can get into <laughs> to precognition storytelling hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, that's, you know, that's absolutely the case uh you know with all of my stuff and i and i you know all of i mean i'm i've had you know 15 16 years of a deepening in, encounter with my own intuition yeah. and i haven't always understood it as you know this uh deepening and expanding or like opening ripening awareness with my transpersonal self mm -hmm. but nowadays i do and i am sure that that understanding will continue to evolve uh but yeah i mean it seems that there are you know it, it sort of borders on things like the question about reincarnation or about mm -hmm. like karma uh so so and, real quick is this is this kind of how you and I know we're not obviously all picking up on precognition all the time, but are you are you saying you're you're getting more into the habit of of sort of being guided by impulse or just some sort of like you're tuning in more to the fact that this could be happening, so 
let's listen to that resonance when you're making decisions. I, okay, so I cut myself loose after my first burn in 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I hitchhiked out to San Francisco expecting to get a trim job that fell through. And so suddenly I was just on foot with all of my crap yeah. in San Francisco for two weeks. And had like, you know, this is like before I had a smartphone, thank God. And <laughs> I had I had like nowhere to be exactly. Yeah. And so I just sort of followed the little bird, you know, like whatever the little bird told me to do. Yeah. And that was sort of where I started developing this this sense for an intuition and listening to it. Actually, it was like at Burning Man that, that really clicked for me because there's just too much stuff to do. And so you can't right. plan, right? You can't plan things because you're on your way to go do something that you really want to do. And you see something else that's amazing yeah. and you end up spending the whole day there. Right. And you know, it's just like a, a fractal puzzle box. It's bigger on the inside. And, uh, so I was like, all right, well, let me sort of try to practice some of this stuff while I'm vagabonding. Mm-hmm. And that by 2010 had really developed into a robust practice where I knew that something was going on because I'd been systematically disobeying my intuition and Mm -hmm. knew that the results were always worse when I did. Okay. And so I started to like unpack it a little bit and started to realize that there were valences. Like, you know, sometimes I would just be like sort of gently recommended not to do something. And other times it was really loud and urgent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I could kind of tell the difference. And then by 2012, uh, I really, I learned, through getting arrested after art outside festival oh man and like having to go through this years long nightmare with the uh texas criminal justice system if you can call it that uh (laughs) there was justice was ultimately served um my one judge was removed from his post (laughs) due to withholding exonerating evidence in a murder trial and then the next judge the next judge ended up spending the rest of his life in federal prison because he was selling machine guns to Mexican gangsters. And then my probation officer and the County court officer both quit their jobs around the same time that I, that I like, you know, was, you know, shit out of this, the bowels of this Leviathan. Yeah. Um, So it was a really weird thing where like by the end of, and then my, my attorney died under mysterious causes. Uh, And so by the time that I was, done with my my probation none of the people assigned to my case were even in, involved in the system anymore so, and so you just tore the, through that system like in a way like it, so, okay. it, it did feel like i was sort of like uh like i was the bleach that they accidentally drank or something <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I don't want to take credit for it, but like I was there. Right, I was part of this right. weird it, mystery it, it's unfolding. It's not like that you knew that that was going to happen necessarily. No, and not like no. you enjoyed it, I'm sure. But in some weird way, as you said, justice was served, right? Right. And, but I mean, it's so the point is that that all happens because I was like ignoring the, you know, Tinkerbell shouting at me. Basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, not to try and drive home that night and sleep in my own bed. Uh, um, that'll get and you instead in trouble. go sit with my buddy by the by the fire yeah you know and i didn't and i ended up getting searched illegally and the rest is history but like you know and that's i actually brought that up in the last conversation with eric and then kind of cut it out because we didn't take it didn't we didn't end up taking it where i really liked but we, we left in a piece about this about what it means to ignore one's precognitions yeah you know, and how how mi- there seems to be something about misunderstanding a premonition or ignoring it or, or, di- you know, disobeying your own intuition. Yeah. That is built into this sort of theological understanding that goes back to, you know, God gives you free will, but, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. even when you're sinning, you're actually doing God's will kind of a, yeah kind of a thing you know yeah that th- this is a paradox if you insist on using only these terms to try and understand it right and so at any rate yeah i do think that time you know it's funny because time clearly flows sort of in one direction but then with all of this backwash um even then like even the water that is pushed back upstream by an eddy 
Mm -hmm. in the Colorado River is still obeying the laws of physics. Right. You know? right. It's just it's just part of this larger flow that has vortices in it. Right. You know, and right. it's nothing special. You know, it's it's something that we've we've seen before in in other places and yeah, yeah do you yeah. think that just certain people via whatever their experience, maybe their genetics are just more apt to get caught in those eddies or to find those eddies? I think you're more likely to notice them if you're a certain kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is, I mean, it's a nature culture thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, hold on, there's a truck outside. Let me close this window. This is, well, I mean, this is actually kind of perfect to, I when I had Tyson, you and Caporta on the call for Future Fossils recently, and we could hear the birds outside of his window. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was perfect because we were talking about how, you know, he brings his whole clan into the conversation. Like we see this one person sitting across from you, you know, mm -hmm. but in reality, that person is the, the uh, still point at the intersection of colliding infinities mm -hmm. or something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's how acid explained it to me once in <laughs> 2012 at a, was it? No, it was, it was, it was mushrooms. Anyway, on April fool's day in 2012 up in gold Hill, uh, my wife nice. and I went up there and, and it was like, yeah, you're, you're still pointed at the intersection of colliding infinities. And, and so you're, uh, you're sort of like bringing other colliding infinities into your uh, orbit or your, yeah, well, you, you talk to Michael Garfield and you get Michael's kids and you get the truck outside right. and yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, this is all, and I, you know, we, I think we, you know, it's, this is part of the cool thing about, uh, I've talked about this also elsewhere where it's like, you know, COVID by taking people out of the sort of laboratory environment of their workplace yeah, and putting them back in, you know, in the wild of their homes, you know, <laughs> you, you see more of this person yeah, than you did on business calls, uh, you know, than you used to. For sure. And so there's more, you know, you know, in a weird way, um, you know, among many, a myriad of other reasons, the lockdown has been psychedelic simply by revealing that which had been hidden by our, our, you know, the systems by which our economy has, has occluded <laughs> the full human being from itself and other people. Yeah. And so, there's, I think that's why so many people are just walking out of their jobs right now. So many. It's great. Oh my God. It's beautiful. Yeah. I'm just waiting. I'm, I'm usually late to the table uh -huh. as far as stuff. I'm either, I'm either too early or too late. I'm never, I'm, I don't feel like I'm ever just like right on time, mm -hmm. except of course, like that's just my head noise. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And you know, it's just, I remember just saying something karma. very similar to you when I first started live painting and uh, you know, I said, ah, oh, I feel like I, I missed the boat. And you were like, ah, that's just your mind talking. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But, yeah. It's crazy to see that though. Right. Um, I went, I went up to the gas station the other day for something and uh, it just, the doors were closed. Everything was shut down and it said closed due to, you know, lack of employees now hiring apply, you know? And it's like, I was like, well, I can't get this, you know, stupid thing that I want, but this is cool, you know, overall, like if, if I'm to look at the big picture and not worry about my, uh, little nicotine pouch addiction, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then I'm like, well, awesome. Cool. Good for them. Good for them for walking out. Um, yeah. Maybe if enough people walk out, you won't feel the need to use nicotine because right. life will have slowed back down to a human pace. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, we just can't sustain this insanity forever. Yes, and this is something I wanted to talk about. Um, in terms of civilization, and we can t we can also throw in if you want to um, NFTs and DAOs and, and <laughs> stuff like this. Where do you see? There's I, a thread. I mean, and yeah, there is for sure. But and I know it won't be one way or the other, which is what we talked about in the beginning. It's not going to be just like, oh, it's going to be an AI singularity utopia or a, 
uh, tyrannical dystopia, but there's going to be all these counter emergent phenomenons coming up and other ones cooperating with each other. But that's all to say, like, how do we incentivize ourselves to not just fuck this whole thing up? Uh, this whole, this whole experiment of civilization, how, how do we uh, incentivize ourselves? If, if you know this, I mean, maybe this might be a stretch cause I, I have no idea, but incentivize ourselves individually and collectively to not just screw the pooch in the next hundred years. Well, I mean, you did also ask in this set of prompts what my greatest fear would be. Yeah. And I, I, I remember back in 2009 standing on the balcony of my friend's apartment in Denver, looking out over the city and saying, all right, we all know that something has to give. Yeah. Does that building have to go? <laughs> you know? Right, yeah. Does like do we have to burn this whole thing to the ground? That doesn't seem right. That right. doesn't like that doesn't seem right for you know, mathematical reasons or for ethical reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you want you know, if you can pull off a bloodless revolution, that's better, right? Yeah. Sometimes. I mean, are you know, arguably there are, it's it's weird how the more I learn about systems, the more I find myself justifying certain, <laughs> you know, like violence over here prevents violence, much more violence somewhere else. Yeah. You know, and, and this is samsara, so you're not getting away from violence entirely, you know, and totally. so you just have to, you know, it's about mitigation. Um, this is the whole funny thing about policing, incidentally, although I, I, kind of a tangent, but that, mm -hmm. you know, if there were no police, there would be no one to settle disputes, you know, in some form or another, you know, right. like somebody performing policing as a function, not police as we now understand them. Right. It's like militarized, you know, Gestapo bullshit. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, people that break up other people's fights. Mediators. Yeah. Um, softer term, I guess, but there's lots of, yeah. Mediation, de-escalation, but you you can't do that without power, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so some kind of power has to exist and yet power is unfair, you know? And yeah. so it's like, so the, so there's this tension here that gets to your, your question about the future, which is about the tension between our individuals and the societies that are their own kind of individual that have their own kind of logic, you know, like I was saying earlier, and like you referenced a moment ago, the, the way that the social contract constrains us, you know, like in terms of the, the options that we're able to pursue. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and arguably living in a society, we, we have a more intimate relationship with the society than we do with each other because all of us That's are interfacing interesting. through this, this, like, you know, we're all like in this coral, but the skeleton, you know, all of the calcium of that coral is what we're all living in. Right. And that's the contract that we have right. with with ourselves and with each other. And no, none of us actually agreed to that, you know, but like right. at the same time, we continue to reinforce it with everything we do. Right. Uh, and so the the thing about the future is I as I see it and as I worry about it is that and i talked about this with kevin kelly on future fossils recently mm -hmm. you know he's a he's a very popular techno evangelist founded mm -hmm. wired magazine he's a really smart interesting guy oh really but like i can't get with some of the things that he says that he espouses like about, what about technology one of which is that you know that the urbanization of the planet is just unequivocally good because you know in his in his frame yeah you know, he, we were right. He, we were talking about this book that he wrote. It's like a photo journal of uh, over a hundred trips that he made to Asia over decades as Asia transitioned from farm, you know, pre-modern agrarian into this hyper-modern futuristic city stuff. And in so doing it wiped out all of these, you know, all of this stuff that had come before Yeah. in order to make room for all this new stuff. 
but the new stuff is not like uniquely Asian, you know, it's, right. it's, it's part of this sort of like new global society. And so, you know, you're losing all of these, you know, land-based traditions. You're losing all of the, this like local close to the ground wisdom and understanding. And like, this, this gets back you know, to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, you can, you can change and mutate so much that you sort of undermine the, the ground in which all this stuff is happening on. Right. That, I mean, the thing is that he, you know, his point is everybody moving into a city is making a sane, rational, sober decision to have to like give up a deeply con confining, like constrained, very limiting kind of oppressive life uh, where you've inherited a tradition and you're going to maintain that tradition and that's what you're going to carry forward. And your father was a cobbler and you're going to be a cobbler right. and, you know, and they're going into a world where they can make themselves and they can, you know, you're, you, you can become rich and you can, you know, experience this amazing palette of opportunity. And on one level, yes, on you know there's more diversity that's generated by this social reactor mm -hmm. of a city but it like it all comes from somewhere right it's all been extracted of out of the diversity that it that it devoured in order to you know and so that you know eventually you're going to run yourself off a cliff doing that um Jeffrey West and I talked about this on the other podcast I do, Complexity Podcast, because he's the guy that came up with the the physics for for cities and how they grow and mm -hmm. what that growth means. And, you know, he was like, yeah, we're at a point now where, you know, in another few years, we're going to have to, in a, we're going to have to invent something as important as like paradigmatic as the internet, like every six months just to wow. like stay on top of the disruption that we're creating. Yeah. You know, like in order to reset the crisis clock, you have to come up with some profound innovation. And every time you do that, the crisis cr clock runs faster and faster and faster. Yeah. And meanwhile, you, because this whole thing is, is running on an economy of scale where like the bigger your networks, the more wealth you can find in them, which is why all of us are stuck on Facebook yeah, for, you know, for the record, it's because you're you're locked in by to the all these economy, people already basically. being there. Yeah, yeah. That eventually you're gonna forget how to, you know, like now we have food deserts. You know, yeah. now people now people don't know how to go through rites of passage into adulthood. I mean, now, in America, I mean, just, we never really had that either. Too. Oh, I mean, it's maybe bad. except it used to be like you know world wars or some kind of war that was the uh the rite of passage uh, well i mean jeffersonian america was a very different thing you know to, yeah. to his credit you know for all of his you know flaws in light of history yeah uh you know jefferson his america was an america that was based on agrarian subsistence farming mm -hmm. that was i think ultimately a lot more like this cottage core fantasy that a lot of us Cottage have court. now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that like you know, that it was a it was a, a an America of village life, of distributed production and distributed governance. And it was an America in which he was encouraging a new revolution every twenty years. You know, that it would constantly overturn itself and it would never yeah. like this painting, it would never get so old and rigid that it would it would, you know, crack or crumble. It would, it would buckle under its own weight. Yeah, there you go. You know, he wanted it to stay young and, and flexible and potent and, and, uh, you know, but now we're in this world where, you know, people have given up that for, like, they've given up subsistence farming for cash crops. And so everybody's competing on an international stage. And like, I've honestly gotten so sick of the business of art over the last 10 years, because now like, you know, all of us are using these, these platforms where you have to winnow yourself down 
to, you know, what's going to get people's attention in almost no time at all. Yep. And you can't be a complete person or somebody is going, you're, you're going to surprise someone in an unpleasant way. And they're going to click that unfollow button. Exactly. <laughs> like, I, you know, like I'll post music, I'll be, you know, like I was doing really well on Instagram for a while there and was like getting up into the thousands of likes a post. Yeah. And then I like changed what I was doing a little bit. Yeah. And now, you know, like just dabbling in digital art and posting more of my music on that page rather than making separate accounts for those and growing right. them separately and being like, I am nine different people. Right. You know, which is not fucking true. Right. Um, you know, and, and am I being a grumpy old man resisting the, the entropic forces of history that are trying to divide mm. us against ourselves? Mm. Yes. Yeah. I am, <laughs> you know, because I mean, on one level it's beautiful, right? Like, yeah, you're a plurality. Stuart Davis and I talked about that in Future Fossils 156, like internal family systems and big mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These psychological things where it's like you're actually a whole bunch of people. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That's that's great. Um, but it's not so great when it's used to divide and conquer you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it should and be, it's not so great. It, it, it should be like many in the one. And right, they're and like we're losing. Maybe it's okay to express your duplicity and your multiplicity in in one that maybe that's your brand but no you know right they won't have yeah. that because um i think that i think that it's because like just off the top of my head because if there's more accounts then that means more engagement no matter what so if they actually divide you split your personality um outside of of the one container that it's in then if you're hopping between accounts i mean i do this with my podcast account and my art account it's like double the engagement, right? And so then they can be like, turn around to their advertisers and be like, you know, since we've split a million people into two, three, four, it's it's the same thing you were talking about in terms of like patents with cities, right? Sort of the same phenomenon where you have one person, but then you you get together um, with other people and you, you, you multiply that way instead of that they're taking one person and dividing them and then multiplying their own revenue that's what it seems to well, me it's like yeah. it's like what global warming is actually doing to coral mm -hmm. you know which is it's eating the skeleton of the coral god you know and so it's like <laughs> we're we're you know the, these when i talked to tyson young caporta on future fossils we talked about how how first the church and now capitalism <clears throat> you know started by trying to pull apart the clan and the tribe so that it could control people as individuals and how like in a weird ironic way, the rational enlightenment and its emphasis on the individual, you know, which is on display in the novel, you know, like the right. novel emerges the as one like this point thing of like, perspective Oh kind of... yeah. Like there's somebody that we're going to talk about, you know, here. Mm -hmm. um, and like this whole thing about like, you know, become a nobody in the city so that you can become somebody, you know, like extract yourself from the, you know, if you think about it, like in terms of what you see in capitalism do with psychedelics now, where you've got magic mushrooms and then compass pathways comes in and creates comp 360, which is like the special formulation of psilocybin that they're able to patent, you know, I because don't like they've, that. yeah, it's <laughs> awful, but I mean, it's, it's because um, it's not just what you're saying. It's, it's also this other part about it, the more narrowly specified something is the easier it is to control quantify <laughs> and control. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, this is another nod to Rich Doyle who points out that chemical extracts are not actually isolating something. They're just alchemically transferring something from an, from its sort of native ecosystem of phytochemicals to an artificial ecosystem of laboratory equipment that like, you know, like if you think about like what it takes to like do like butane hash or CO2 hash extraction, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like you're, you're taking something that was like inside this like complex interdependent milieu of terpenes and su such and such structural plant components. Yeah. 
and it you're like waving a magic wand and mm. suddenly it's inside a bunch of tubes yeah you know and like that that you know we because the glass lab chemical equipment that we use is invisible to us in the way that Marshall McLuhan talked about media being the invisible environment. Yeah. That we don't recognize that this is also, you know, that this is the, th this built environment is not, uh, non-existent, you know, it's like, it's, it's like a, uh, a pre-modern ether well, through which light propagates or something. It's like, it's there, it's yeah, invisible. Yeah. Right. You know, but it is it is there and or, it is influencing everything we do. Yeah. Or even more visible is is the idea that even if we're not living in a simulation as like simulation theory talks about it, we're living in a simulation because we've built societies and civilization and and, and all, you know, it's sort of a simulacrum, and especially when you get into the realm of the internet and social media. It's like it's invisible, but it's it's playing such a huge effect. I mean, we're seeing the effects, but you can't see the the internet as a physical thing other than what you see on your desktop, right? I mean, well, I mean, this is this is why uh, I can't get this damn chapter done because <laughs> part of it is just about how we domesticated ourselves, you know, and like we're we're still sitting here thinking, oh, you know, the Matrix. Like there are sentinels out there. There's an architect. It's like, nah, sorry. No. Like we did this, yeah. we did this to ourselves. Right, right. And that's a much more difficult thing to to reckon with. You mm -hmm. know, we want there to be some sort of archon. To blame. That, yeah, yeah. Like we want we want this uh this um <laughs> sort of Gnostic <laughs> thing where, you know, we're and on on one level I'm very sympathetic to that because it's, I think it is foolish to think that we've reached, you know, that we're like the bedrock, you know, <laughs> universe or right. whatever. Right, right, You right. know, that there's only one and it's us. That's like yeah. very, that's very colonial. Very, it's very silly. very bullshitty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very like, we come to we come to the new world and there's no one living here, you know. Oh, except or these like, guys. Animals don't yeah. have language. Yeah, it's like, get, yeah. shut the fuck up. Uh -huh. You know, I'm, I'm anti-exceptionalist Okay. Uh, in that regard. Yeah. Or Copernican, you know, in that I think it's important to continue to humble ourselves and like move ourselves out of the center of the story. But of course, if everything is like a Mobius strip, then you know we, we're in the center no matter what. You're but in the center so is no everything matter else, what. and yeah. you have to grant everything else its own center. Exactly. I think that's, exactly. that's, that's a, the non-human turn. Yeah, yeah. That that seems like the model that makes most sense, I suppose. Yeah, but so to the you know to the future, I I yeah. think that the forces that are, you know, encouraging us to move into cities, encouraging us to proliferate our personae online and like, you know, embrace this, this uh, being, you know, ripped apart by demons as we enter the underworld of our technology, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, look, that's all part of the, all... greater historical cycle that we're involved in and this on is the one come level... up right it's the uh, come up on mushrooms <laughs> yeah, except exactly. with technology exactly exactly and it, I, I gave a talk at the commonwealth bank of australia in 2017 where i said listen um the internet is psychedelics yeah and the only difference is that rather than it knocking the walls down between the different parts of your brain that normally don't talk to each other. It's knocking the walls down between people and between cultures that don't normally, and between ecosystems that don't normally talk to each other. And like, you know, shout out to COVID-19, yeah. whether you regard it as something that crossed into humans from a pangolin or a bat, or you regard it as something that escaped from a laboratory. It is nonetheless the case that we live in this age where we, we are actively attacking all of the boundaries that have evolved over thousands or millions of years for a reason. Right. Because we're on this weird ideological crusade to disrupt ourselves and innovate, you know, our way out of a disaster that was created by innovation. Whoops. <laughs> you know, and so we keep swallowing the spider to catch the fly <laughs> and this can't go on forever. Yeah. And the question of 
how it does not go on forever is what complete like what occupies me yeah you know because it's not like it's not just like singularity transcendence or collapse right you already right. said this you're like it's, it can't just be one or the other sure there are ways in which and it's not just going to be that way for some people and not that way for other people it's like i'm living in unimaginable luxury and a much shittier con- set of conditions than my parents were in yeah. a number of different ways right 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 you know right and so that's going to be the same for my kids it's like they're you know they're going to be privy to unbelievable amazing things and at the same time facing struggles that i am immensely grateful i don't have to deal with yeah and sorry that they will yeah you know and 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 it's it's just a matter of like luck honestly like where you happen to be standing you yeah. know this is very very fractal and and multi-dimensional right. and you know so like for instance just like if you if you boil everything down to financial wealth rich people are not happy yeah on the whole you know yeah most of on them the are. Whole, yeah they're not yeah and you know they might live you know like paul red might look at 57 or whatever like he did when he was 35 you know, there are certain benefits to being yeah, yeah. rich. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, he's, you know, he has to walk through life in fear. Yeah. You know, of being recognized, recognized. And, yeah, yeah. and bothered and, yeah. and stalked and all sorts of weird shit. That's funny. I was talking with Randall yesterday about Bill Murray and his sort of tactics since the 80s has been um, oh, yeah. like complete isolation like even when his manager or agent tries to get a hold of him they had to they would have to send him a letter like a handwritten letter in the mail and if it was for like hey you should come do this uh show or this movie or whatever like show up on letterman he would either the way they would get their answer is like he would either show up or he wouldn't (laughs) and so i you know like I don't know why I just took that tangent, but I guess just because it's fresh on my mind. And that's kind of an interesting way to live. In, it's kind of like this nice contrast to what we were talking about in terms of this all-inclusive, uh, manically innovating society that we all sort of feel compelled to like chase or like be a part of the, the movement towards, well, hopefully it's not a cliff, uh, but to the edge or some sort of edge, right? It's a cliff, but it's, it's the, the question is how far down, uh, how is it a cliff? How far down do you have superpowers that you can like shape the reshape the landscape? So suddenly you're climbing uphill again instead yeah, yeah. of down, you know, like it's not, you know, I think people get stuck in this sort of, uh, I think, you know, one of the core premises of the book is that the, the future that somebody tells you about is very telling of them yeah. Right. And their own biases, you know, and how if, you know, if the glass is half empty, well, you know, chances are your your grandparents went through a famine or some crap, you know, like it's <laughs> yeah. it's some like epigenetic. It's, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we carry all this stuff into these these what they call Bayesian priors, which is like the probability is weight that we put on any given, you know, claim or, or outcome. Mm hmm. And everybody's got different priors. Yeah, everybody's yeah. got a different experience, and so they're bringing in you know these different probability assessments, and so you know you you get brilliant people that go to, like cl- you know head to head on really you know things that you, it just astounds me on a daily basis how ignorant people are about this. Yeah, that like you know that people would be like based on the same the drake equation right which is mostly that's a planetary variables planetary yeah it's mostly unknown variables but it's like some uh drake's attempt to formalize the probability of intelligent life out there in the cosmos uh-huh. yeah and the way that a lot of people read it is oh well it's got to be there because the numbers are so great that even if we don't know any of these you know variables like it's there you know, and it's just by the end of it, you get to like whether the aliens are, you know, in a technological phase that compat- is compatible with yours at the same time that you are. And at that point, it's like, eh, who knows? Yeah, yeah. 
But like for sure, this says that there are there's life. alien civilizations out there somewhere. But then other people read the same thing and they're they're looking at the same cosmological evidence and they're like, yeah, no, I'm not I'm not optimistic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's yeah. just like so. Yeah, I just I uh, <laughs> and 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 everybody because all of us are doing this sort of like. We're trying, you know, like a machine learning algorithm, all of us are just trying to create a best fit hypothesis about the world based on the evidence that we have been trained on. Right. Then, uh, then you know, we we get it wrong all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, because there's always, you know, your your training data set is really biased and, and limited. Absolutely. And actually better... To your point about like, do you think some people are like natural precognitive? Yeah, yeah. Naturally more precognitive than others. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, because you see, you know, to bring this totally full circle, like schizo people, you know, the, the, there's like the fine line between genius and madness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has to do with people relaxing their filters, kind of, you know, like your brain is a pattern seeking organ. And people like my dad are very narrowly specified, highly productive, and they throw out all sorts of stuff. They're just like, nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, no, nah, that's not relevant. <sighs> Whereas I, for whatever reason, have been trained to like see fucking Virgin Mary in a slice of toast, <laughs> you know, and totally. I'm, I'm, I'm knocking false positives all the time. Right, right. And so people don't trust me when I say something that's going to happen and it does. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like but i'm like hey this you know because they just assume that i'm oh it's you know, michael i'm yeah. seeing the virgin toast again yeah you know? <laughs> uh but i mean but this is this is the thing is that like there are it's it's about how much noise you inject into your learning algorithm uh and and we know that a some amount of noise is really good mm -hmm. that you know, that if you're trying to forecast weather, which is a famously, you know, chaotic and unpredictable phenomenon, that's why, you know, chaos theory emerges out of, out of, you know, meteorology. Oh, nice. And, I and, didn't know uh, that. Well, I mean, like, you know, in part, uh, James sure, Blake's sure. book, Chaos, talks about this. It's, it's a really solid history of the, the discipline. And yeah, so like, yeah, out of weather patterns, but then also out of, out of, uh, like, you know, uh, particle physics and, you know, stuff going down, right. down at that level, uh, that if you're trying to predict, forecast the weather, there is a like concrete mathematical horizon to how far you can go based on just training something with data. Mm -hmm. But then if you have a reservoir of noise that you inject into your algorithm to kind of shake it up, then you get, you can forecast further into the future because the noise helps your model that you that the machine has built of the world sort of approach the actual chaos and complexity of the world itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because again, it's like it's not free will or determinism, and a machine learning algorithm is deterministic. Right. You know, our cultural conditioning is deterministic. Whereas psychedelics, for instance, or, you know, neurodivergent factors yeah. uh, make, you know, help keep someone open to the, the noise. Yes. And all forms of oracular practice are about t like listening to the noise, like turning on the TV static yeah. or the tea leaves or shuffling a deck of cards yeah. or whatever. It's like you train yourself on a pattern of, 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 associations you learn what all the tarot cards mean right you understand the, how they relate to one another in a system but then you shuffle it all up and that tells you something more profound about yourself than it would if you just picked the cards you like right oh yeah for you sure know? for sure yeah. um, you inject and, you inject a sort yeah. of randomness and and, and chaos right. into the process it, I guess the question is, when is too much chaos? When is too much noise? And how do you find the signal in all that? 
you, you know, I guess you train yourself by, I think psychedelic, the whole time you're talking about that, I was like, this is sort of what psychedelics does, right? Sort of what dream interpretation does and uh, meditation even. You, you have, like, I guess meditation is kind of the opposite. I don't know how to articulate this, but it's like you have your just, your your latent noise that is always sort of going on in your head discursive thoughts uh sensations all these things and you learn how to find the that singular point right or non-local point whatever you want to think of it as where it is where you're just being before thought it's like this place prior to all that do you think that those are uh, good ways to to find signal in the noise in your experience? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I will I will add that just you know just because I finished editing a conversation with Daniel Shankin of Tam Integration, mm-hmm. it does you know psychedelic integration work, and uh, Tam Integration has an awesome Instagram page. I recommend people follow. That's T A M. T A M. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's he's hilarious, but he's, he's a, you know, a long time bhakti yoga practitioner who got into integration counseling. And we, we had a conversation about, you know, there's, I have long since stopped acting as a proponent for people to take more drugs or sure innovate harder. I don't think that, I mean, there's a lot of people that are sadly, alienated from their own creativity and i'm happy i mean god if you're listening to this and you're one of those people then let's talk and i'll help you figure it out but like overall in my life it's the opposite problem and i think in civilization in general it's the opposite problem which is that there's too much noise there's too much creativity there's too much going on Mm -hmm. uh, there's too much innovation and what we need is integration and so like for the years that i was living in boulder you know, I was part of a, a, a community that was really, you know, talking about like, you know, pushing the evolutionary frontier. And I'm like, look, nobody needs to push the river. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the river it's is doing gone. just fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, like what we, what we need uh, are people that like know how to like plant next to the river, Yeah, yeah. you know, that know how to like listen to the cycles of things and like structure, uh, you know, structure like rice terraces or whatever. So that the water, water flows through this landscape in a way that is like structured and useful. And, or even, or even people who know how to uh, navigate the eddies and, and find hidden treasure there. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm now on, on the point of like, we don't need, people to be just like taking ayahuasca all the time, like addicted to this process of like healing their ancestors. Like, okay, cool. Some people are doing that and, you know, thank you for your service. Yeah. But like, that's not, um, you can't build an entire society out of that. Right. You know? And, you know, if, if everyone tried to be a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, this whole thing would tank in like 20 years. Yeah. You know, and if everybody so like, was like uh, <laughs> taking the Gary V formula and, and, and you know, going right. with that, it would it would fall off the cliff. Yeah, we absolutely we do absolutely. need sort of like still points. That's a good point. And not just it's it's to the you know, the still point of meditation allows things to like swirl together into rest and like find, the you know, like the, the various parts like kind of meet in the drain Mm-hmm. and like take shape there mm-hmm. rather than just like swirling around yeah. yes um but also like you know i i mean like dream journaling you list that i don't know that that's i don't i don't see that so much as a an exercise for creativity as i see it as an exercise for integration for like making sense mm-hmm. uh for <clears throat> understanding what is happening to you which is necessary in a time that like, if you're just constantly bombarded by this like onslaught of new experiences with no rest, no pause, no opportunity to reflect. Yeah. And you will be broken by it. I mean, that's know? the most, that's the, you know, from 
my experience and from what a lot of smarter and more experienced people say, integration is the most essential part of the psychedelic experience. It's like you're not getting yeah. anywhere without integration. Yeah. You know, so it's, I mean, again, it's like in my, in my paintings, I've always liked leaving parts of the, the work unfinished because I'm pointing people to their processual right. essence, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah, this was layered onto a thing, you know, a canvas one piece at a time. And so you, I kind of like, like a, almost like a medical diagram, like where you, you know, you see yeah, yeah. there's the guy, his skin, and then you pull it back and there's the fascia and the muscles. And then you pull another layer back and there's the bones and like painting in that way has always been really satisfying to me mm -hmm. and like structuring music in that way too. So it's like you start, you just, it's just the guitar, but then yeah. like by the second verse, you've gotten to like the full thing with the synths and everything. Yeah. And you know, yeah, we just, that there's, there's, there's a place for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I, I really, I really, all that said though, is I guess, again, to thank you for suggesting that I leave parts <laughs> yeah. of this book just unfinished. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you know, and parts of this thing, you know, but, and that somehow like, th that's not, that's not a paradox to like leave parts of your rug unwoven and sell it, you yeah. know, but it's, 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 it's just part of an aesthetic it, that yes. is, re that, is, you know, seeks to remind whoever buys the rug that this was woven right by somebody right you know right um all right well yeah man i i always enjoy talking to you you you've got a great mind and a great perspective i love how you're able to like drill down into things while simultaneously expanding like the the bigger picture um, you make me sound like the goat head burrs I'm relentlessly pulling out of my yard. The they have this like tap root. They're the little uh -huh. bastards that you're constantly like yeah, poking yeah. a hole through your foot. Yes, I remember. Okay. Yeah, they're they're an invasive species from Eurasia. I learned recently, and so now I don't Ooh. feel bad about pulling them all out here in New Mexico. Yeah. But they look so pretty. They have these beautiful little, you know, fuzzy leaves and these gorgeous little yellow flowers. And then these like fat, like ball, spiny ball sack seeds spike that just like things. rape feet and bike tires and <laughs> Well, that's cattle. not the, uh, that's not what I was going for, but. Uh, no, but they get the tap root and then they grow really fast and really broad. Yeah. You know? So okay. when you talk about, when you, when you, when you talk about like a T-shaped individual, you know, somebody with like a specialty, but lots of like sort of peripheral knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that plant is a success for that reason. Right. He's doing it. Right. You know, all respect to the enemy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that's a, that's one way to take a compliment. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, man, I, I guess we'll, I want to wrap it up here, but I wanted to, to ask you, usually I ask people kind of like what advice they would give um, younger creative people, but in light of uh, just our recent portion of the conversation, what what are some books or resources that you would recommend that you think everyone should read? Maybe maybe to sort of um, buffer their own tendency to go manically innovative. Oh God. <laughs> uh, well. I'll just list a couple of books that we've talked about and a couple that we've recently discussed on future fossils that I think have helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. And so there's an anchor point. If you want to hear more conversations about this stuff, I guess, uh, you know, one is Eric Wargo and yeah. he's got two books on his time loop stuff. One is called time loops mm -hmm. and that's the first and more kind of rigorous of the two. And then he's got another more recent one called precognitive dream work in the long self which focuses less on the science and more on the, the sort of psycho spiritual dimensions of his ideas. And so I, you know, but I, I preferred time loops because I wanted mm -hmm. to get into the, you know, his, his like steel man argument, you know, back when he was still trying to convince people, uh, 
and you know he stopped trying to convince people with <laughs> his later work and was just like all right i'm going to work with the people that recognize that this is happening and we're going to see what we can do with it yeah and but i think that his his stuff about you know his exploration in time loops about quantum physics and there being this sort of underdog interpretation of quantum physics that enables and actually kind of requires his interpretation of time uh, in order to explain a bunch of mysteries about physics is mm -hmm. really fascinating. And then, you know, he gets into like Jungian and Freudian psychology too, and, and talks a lot about synchronicity in that book and how synchronicity is not like an, an a causal principle, but is actually very much a nonlinear temporal causal kind of phenomenon in which you're not being guided by, you know, some sort of timeless self per se. You're, you're being guided into experiences that will enrich you through the process of surviving to have them and then being able to reflect upon them. And like, mm -hmm. so at any rate, I love that book. I recommend it highly. Uh, I, like I said, I, I recently had Tyson Yung Caporta on the show and his book sand talk how indigenous thinking can change the world mm -hmm. i found that to be very very helpful in in terms of the way that he you know he's talking about complex systems but he's talking about them as an australian clansman you know as like an as as somebody who is initiated into an aboriginal tradition mm -hmm. and as someone who still uses pre-modern memory techniques for writing complex narrative information into his own body as a mnemonic, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, is also an academic living in the modern world who has done research on how these techniques outperform certain other, like the memory palace technique mm -hmm. uh, used by, you know, Europeans. And, and he's a fascinating guy. His book talks a lot about, about, trauma and change and you know how people can decolonize kind of and like reconnect to their indigeneity and you know he he was he's got some beautiful passages in that book about like swedish reindeer subsistence mm -hmm. tribal peoples who are like blacker than he is even though they're like blonde and blue eyed <laughs> you know because just because of like their their relationship to this like global accelerationist thing yeah yeah you know like the way that they are even more grounded in their place and in their tradition and in their communities mm -hmm. than he feels himself to be and you know and and so he's he's one of a few readers or a few writers that I've I've read recently that I think makes really really important distinctions in you know this stuff that people are very quick to even, even people who claim to be allies of the, the underrepresented mm -hmm. uh, get wrong, yeah. you know, about, about what it means to be human and what it means to be a, you know, a, a, a steward of this planet and, you know, a, you know, a decent person and stuff like this. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's an amazing guy and I'm really, I'm really honored to know him and to know that he thinks reasonably well of me. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of like if you're, do kids and animals like you, you know? Like, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. Right. Right. It doesn't right. matter if the, if your boss likes you, except right. that it does if you need to feed people, you know? <laughs> like, true, <laughs> true. But, but, like, on a broader sense, it matters a whole lot more if, like, you know, the innocent a deer things. doesn't run away from you, right? Yeah, because you're exuding like stink lines of your robot bullshit or whatever. You know, so anyway, um, Lydie Klotz. How you do you know, spell that? I, L e i d y k l o t z. He was on the show recently, also. He wrote a book called Subtract: The Untapped Science of Less. And when you talk about, you know, trying to find signal over over noise and all you know mm -hmm. integration and all this stuff he and i met in conversation over the bridge of this truth of like you know the famous mark twain 
statement that like, oh, I'm, I would have written you a shorter letter. I'm sorry. I didn't have time. <laughs> you know, that like it actually takes time. It takes attention to, to, to editing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, that is, I know you wanted to talk about the invisible work of podcasting, but like people have no fucking clue why it takes so long for me to get a new future fossils episode out. Yeah. It's because I do a two hour conversation takes like 15 hours to edit. That's why I don't edit you know? mine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, great. Good for you. I wish that I had the, the sheer balls to, to do that. I mean, I mean, to me, I, I listen to recordings of myself unedited and I sound like a total idiot. But, I don't think you know. so. I mean, um, also, I think this conversation has flowed pretty well. Just to just to, uh, as an aside, I suppose, to to throw out there. I mean, if I could hire an editor, sure, I would. I would do that. But we all know uh, that that's uh, that takes a while to build up uh, some sort of steam. Support the Artsy AF Patreon folks definitely and clipping Fossils that patreon yes and future listen, Fossils. listen i know that you grow weed or you trim weed and you're making more money than, than either or of you us. make art in denver or whatever it is that you do <laughs> where you know you're you're just unbelievably affluent thanks to the sanity of being able to grow money uh-huh. and you know <laughs> rather than d- rely on debt creation for money so, like, if you are involved in the cannabis economy, support this podcast and support my podcast. Yes. <laughs> I'm normally not Super. this shameless, but, like, come on. Like, yeah. I, I really do not want to be stuck at a desk job for the rest of my my damned life. Um, I have better things to do. Get that book out. And you can help me, <laughs> and you can help Andrew make his amazing artwork and have more of these conversations. Yes. Um, We're definitely clipping that. I'll tell you that us. much. That's going to yeah. be edited. That's going to be its own clip. Michael. That'll be the intro. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Okay. So, but like subtract. Lady yeah, Klotz's yeah. book. Yeah. Sorry. Is a really beautiful tour of all of the ways that like you actually enhance something by removing from it. Yes. You know, like we we're biased to thinking that you have to add in order to fix or solve. And in many cases you don't, you know, like sometimes you need to remove concrete over a an historic waterway yeah. so as to restore the like natural chemical and biological cycles of a given yes. biotope so that like you can rejuvenate your downtown like suddenly you have a river flowing through downtown and there's a place <laughs> people want to be and the water is healthy and shout like, out lexington instead of being kentucky a sewer flowing underground <laughs> that's like yeah. just belching noxious crap that's e- like ruining the e- the the fields and yeah you know like you know no, like sometimes you just have to pull stuff out that's such an apt uh thing to say this that's my hometown of uh lexington they have a stream that's the story we talk about yeah lexington kentucky we talk yeah. about that yeah. yeah yeah and that's why i was like i gotta get the fuck out of here <laughs> there's literally a stream going underneath rep arena where the f- famous kentucky wildcats play basketball and uh once I found out about that, I was like, that's, you know, I already knew that the city was poorly planned in terms of like design and engineering and all this stuff. And then I found out about that and I was like, I think I'm going to move. I think I'm going to leave. The success story though, is that they went ahead and they pulled a lot of that shit out. Oh, they did. They redesigned the downtown. Yeah. When when was this? It might have been after I moved. I don't know. It was after you moved. Yeah. Yeah. But like they, they went through this whole thing and I forget the woman's name, the, the, the planner, the uh, the civil design planner who came up with this whole thing is now like a, an international rock star. Well, hell and she's yeah. being called out all, like, all over the world to help people kind of like, you know, carefully and selectively remove bad ideas from right. their city to right. restore life and creativity to them. Yeah, yeah. You know? I will say um, every time I go know, back... Each year, I'm like, man, it seems cooler here. I wish I was like 20, 23 again, you know, when That's all this stuff was, Kansas City. It was going down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kansas City is definitely a, a vastly more interesting place than it was when I was living there. Well, shouts Getting to that lady. Getting arrested for shoplifting at Walmart because it was the only thing open after 10 p.m. It was Meyer for me, so. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Meyer's cooler than Walmart. I, you, you got lucky. Yeah. Well, I was stealing some uh, osium and uh, and lighters. I wonder what for. <laughs> they searched yeah. me and found a little, uh, you know, um, my brain is going blank, the little cigarette plastic with uh, some nugs in there. So that was great. <laughs> This is a great way to end the podcast. Michael Garfield, yeah. everybody. Thank Shop you. Shoplifting. So- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, thank you so much for real. And um, yeah. you're, you're just, you're, you're an inspiration, man. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And thank uh, you. You're, you're happy an to awesome know you. Guy. I'm glad to be your friend. I'm and glad likewise. that you're doing this show. And I, I think that you make for a, a fabulous host because you are, a sensitive person and a listener in, in all the great, the right ways. Thanks, man. And, uh, it, bu- it bums me out that <laughs> I left Colorado right around the time that you and everybody else was showing up, but you know, so it is. Yeah. The streams of, uh, cause and effect, I suppose. Yeah. There we go. And thank you for having me. And absolutely, and man. To everybody listening, thank you for making it two and a half hours into this. Yeah, yeah. Bonanza of nonsense. You guys, you guys are rock stars, and um, I will not edit this. So shouts to that, and uh, thanks Glad again. I didn't talk about my K holes. <laughs> you sort of danced around it. I kind of yeah, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> you did. The people who know know. So again, thank you, and thanks everybody for listening. We'll see you next time. Recordings. Thank you again for listening to another episode of RTAF Podcast. If you are interested in supporting the Patreon, that address is patreon.com slash RTAF Podcast. And I want to thank all my patrons You guys keep this engine running. I couldn't do it without you. Go over there and check out the tiers I have available. Includes video, uh, guest suggestions, uh, patron-only posts, and some merchandise. Thank you again for listening. Please rate, review, subscribe. Do all those little things that help get RTAF into the consciousness of more and more people. Shh. Yeah, 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 yeah